welcome back to another episode of Exponential Africa, where we are in the Singularity U South Africa Summit, the third summit of, of, in 2019, and it's been a, a beautiful, hot, sunny day. We are fortunate enough to be with Rachel Sibley, who is a Singularity University faculty on AR and VR. Rachel's had an illustrious career in augmented and virtual reality platforms, being one of the key developers and, and uh, instrumental people in developing parts of the Leap Motion, as well as that new cat, that incredible cat uh, anatomy. That but we've got to give Kichi Matsuda credit on that. He was the lead designer and did an amazing job. And uh, you're working with some incredible, incredible designers. Mm -hmm. Rachel, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Mick. And thanks for being in South Africa. Oh, it's a pleasure. I love being in South Africa. We want to uh, really dive deep into the worlds of AR and VR, and you talk a lot about this. Where do you see AR and VR helping the, in the future of humanity? If we're contextualizing it specifically for South Africa, and then Africa, and then humanity, I would say education and training is a huge opportunity space. We have the ability to scale immersive learning with augmented and virtual reality. We can dematerialize and thus demonetize by digitizing the most high impact way of learning, which is fully embodied interactive learning. Where we have disparities in access to education, that really matters. So democratizing access to the best kinds of education in a place like South Africa and in Africa in general, that would transform the world very clearly. What you're saying is the 60s, it's the 60s in action, mm -hmm. Peter Demand is the 60s, mm -hmm. where you could create a lab at, at, a much, at a fraction of the price digitally mm -hmm. versus having that lab equipment in, in reality, mm -hmm. right? Correct. So we've seen this, for example, I, I know that you've created content like this with uh, Man Made, yes. where students can actually learn about chemistry in an interactive narrative way where they're constructing oxygen molecules with the precise amount of protons and neutrons and electrons so that they have an interactive, immersive narrative experience. And we know from thinkers like Edgar Dale that after two weeks we tend to remember 10% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, and 90% of what we do. So in terms of retention and in efficiency in learning, interactive immersive learning is clearly the most high impact way to scale not only children's education or adult education, but also how to retrain our workforces, which is very relevant in a time of such massive shifts. I mean, it's really exciting. Instead of actually you know, learning about the universe, you could be in the universe experiencing it. I often talk about uh, the thought experiment, what would our children, what would our next generation look like if they had an embodied relationship to concepts like quantum physics, which some of us have some concept of, but very few of us have intuitive understandings because we haven't had enough learning in that context to really make educated guesses, so to speak. Whereas most of us understand Newtonian physics because we've been picking up balls and throwing, throwing them to our parents since we were three years old. We've had embodied learning experiences. So Newtonian physics is very simple for most people to grasp, and we understand gravity. Quantum physics, not so much. But if we could create virtual worlds where we could expose our young minds to these concepts, we would really open up entire new domains of learning and opportunity. Absolutely. I think a lot of guys are talking about this idea of tacit knowledge. Mm -hmm. It gives you this, this actual, the knowledge where you are experiencing, instead of having uh, knowledge where it's just you know, a bit ethereal, mm -hmm. it's, it's real and it's physical and, and, you, and you can, by, by having it in a physical space, mm -hmm. Um, you, 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 it's more embodied and more immersive. Is that what you were saying? Well, it's very interesting because we have to strike this balance between the technology and our natural human inclinations, correct? So we've actually been evolved by thousands of years of evolution to learn in very kinesthetic ways. We don't learn best the way that computers learn best. We are different. Our organisms have amazing sensory systems. This is actually part of why it's challenging to create truly comfortable virtual experiences, well-designed immersive experiences, because anything that doesn't shape up to our lived experience is subpar. So it's a, it's a challenge to design beautiful, immersive virtual experiences. But when you get it right, you can create such transformations for people through things like body transfer and immersion in fundamentally new, new environments. Amazing. And I mean, a lot of people, a lot of parents are quite scared mm -hmm. about this virtual reality revolution because mm -hmm. they worry that their kids will become unsocial, they mm -hmm. won't be living in the real world anymore. Mm -hmm. well, what, are you, what is your take on that? We do have to really think deeply about the safety and ethics concerns of virtual reality specifically and augmented reality as well. 
And I would also encourage us to keep an open mind. It's natural to fear change. It's a very human instinct. And yet, these tools provide us access to so many new solutions to real human problems, so we shouldn't disregard them. That said, we do need more research on the impact on brain development. Right now, most headsets say that 12 years is sort of the age that you should allow children to start playing frequently with VR, simply because we don't know how it will impact brain development and vision. Thus far, interestingly, the one thing that's been noted when we have children use headsets is that you are you're more quick to diagnose whether they need glasses, because when you have the headsets on, it's oh, more wow. apparent whether a child has a, a different visual experience than other children. So it's strange what emerges, and we, we have to do the inquiry. We have to actually test for these outcomes. So time will tell. Correct, to some extent, although we can design good experiments to help inform us. I mean, for me, VR, when I go into the different VR platforms, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very social environment. Yes. I'm chatting to people from all around the world. Mm -hmm. I've made friends. Absolutely. In places where I never could imagine. And, uh, you know, if, uh, people don't realize that it is very social, and it's, and, it, and it's going to change the way we socialize with each other. One of the things I often share is I have such, I feel so privileged to be able to travel around the world and work with people to build these experiences and share my views on them. But one of my favorite places to do that is in the virtual world. So at a conference, I tend to meet certain types of people. But when I go into the virtual world, I meet entirely different communities. And I always poll my audience because I'm a user experience researcher at heart. And so I find out there's a 16-year-old from Israel and an 85-year-old woman in a nursing home in Alabama whose grandson set up a VR headset for her. And she's going into a virtual world and interacting with people that she would never be able to access otherwise. And that, to me, is incredibly powerful because it opens up the doors for all kinds of communities to connect with one another, to transact, to create businesses, to learn in new ways. You could imagine a future quite easily where a young child in Switzerland grows up playing with a young child from Bangladesh in a virtual world that is coded to look like the streets of France. That will fundamentally change who we think we are as people. It will fundamentally change how restrictive we consider our own identities to be yes. and what the lines of us and them look like as well. Not to mention things like how do you police virtual workers who are moving across geographic boundaries. We have all kinds of questions to address in this space. We run out of time. So we are going to carry on this conversation in virtual reality. Make sure to uh, get a headset so that you can join us in, in our VR platform. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and make sure to like and subscribe to our page and we'll catch you on the next Exponential Africa. Thank you, Mick. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks.